Chapter Twenty of *The Giant's Robe* by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. A Declaration of War. On the morning of the day which witnessed Dolly's happy deliverance from the terrors which had haunted her so long, Mabel had received a note from Harold Caffin. He had something to say to her. He wrote, which could be delayed no longer. He could not be happy until he had spoken. If he were to call some time the next morning, would she see him, alone? These words she read at first in their most obvious sense, for she had been suspecting for some time that an interview of this kind was coming, and even felt a little sorry for Harold, of whom she was beginning to think more kindly. So she wrote a few carefully worded lines, in which she tried to prepare him as much as possible, for the only answer she could give but before her letter was sent dolly had told her story of innocent guilt mabel read his note again and tore up her reply with burning cheeks she must have misunderstood him it could not be that he must have felt driven to repair by confession the harm he had done and she wrote instead i shall be very willing to hear anything you may have to say and took the note herself to the pillar-box on the hill Harold found her answer on returning late that night to his room, and saw nothing in it to justify any alarm. "'It's not precisely gushing,' he said to himself, but she couldn't very well say more just yet. I think I am pretty safe. So the next morning he stepped from his hansom to the Langton's door, leisurely and coolly enough. Perhaps his heart was beating a little faster, but only with excitement and anticipation of victory, for after Mabel's note he could feel no serious doubts. He was shown into the little boudoir looking out on the square, but she was not there to receive him. She even allowed him to wait a few minutes, which amused him. How like a woman, he thought. She can't resist keeping me on the tenterhooks a little, even now. There was a light step outside. She had come at last, and he started to his feet as the door opened. "'Mabel!' he cried. He had meant to add, my darling, but something in her face warned him not to appear too sure of her yet. She was standing at some distance from him, with one hand lightly resting on a little table. Her face was paler than usual. She seemed rather to avoid looking at him, while she did not offer to take his outstretched hand. Still, he was not precisely alarmed by all this. Whatever she felt, she was not the girl to throw herself at any fellow's head. She was proud, and he must be humble, for the present. "'You had something to say to me, Harold.' With that, with what a pretty shy hesitation she spoke his name now, he thought, with none of the sisterly frankness he had found so tantalising. And how delicious she was, as she stood there, in her fresh white morning dress." There was a delightful piquancy in this assumed coldness of hers, a woman's dainty device to delay and heighten the moment of surrender. He longed to sweep away all her pretty defences, to take her to his arms and make her own that she was his for ever. But somehow he felt a little afraid of her. He must proceed with caution. Yes, he said, there is something I must say to you. You will give me a hearing, Mabel, won't you? i told you i would hear you i hope you will say something to make me think of you differently he did not understand this exactly but it did not sound precisely encouraging i hoped you didn't think me a very bad sort of fellow he said and then as she made no answer he plunged at once into his declaration he was a cold lover on the stage but practice had at least given him fluency and now he was very much in earnest. He had never known till then all that she was to him. There was real passion in his voice, and a restrained power which might have moved her once. But Mabel heard him to the end only because she felt unable to stop him without losing control over herself. She felt the influence of his will, but it made her the more thankful that she had so powerful a safeguard against it. He finished, and she still made no response, and he began to feel decidedly awkward. But when at last she turned her face to him, although her eyes were bright, it was not with the passion he had hoped to read there. 
and it really was that after all she said bitterly do you know i expected something very different i said what i feel i might have said it better perhaps he retorted but at least tell me what you expected me to say and i will say that yes i will tell you i expected an explanation an explanation he repeated blankly of what is there nothing you can remember which might call for some excuse if you found i had heard of it i will give you every chance harold think is there nothing caffyn had forgotten the stamp episode as soon as possible as a disagreeable expedient to which he had been obliged to resort and which had served its end and so he honestly misunderstood this question upon my soul no he said earnestly i don't pretend to have been any better than my neighbours but since i began to think of you i never cared about any other woman if you've been told any silly gossip mabel laughed but not merrily oh it's not that really it did not occur to me to be jealous at any time especially now harold dolly has told me everything about that letter she added as he still looked doubtful he understood now at all events and took a step back as if to avoid a blow everything his brain seemed dulled for an instant by those words he thought that he had said enough to prevent the child from breathing a syllable about that unlucky letter and now mabel knew everything but he recovered his power of thought almost directly feeling that this was no time to lose his head i suppose i'm expected to show some emotion he said lightly it's evidently something quite too terrible but i'm afraid i want an explanation this time i think not but you shall have it i know that you came in and found that poor child tearing off the stamp from some old envelope of mine and had the wickedness to tell her she had been stealing do you deny it some old envelope the worst of caffyn's fear vanished when he heard that she did not know that it contained an unread letter then she did not guess how could she when dolly herself did not know it where the letter had come from he might appease her yet caffyn's first inference it may be said was correct in dolly's mind her guilt had consisted in stealing a marked stamp and her hurried and confused confession had quite innocently and unconsciously left mabel ignorant of the real extent and importance of what seemed to her a quite imaginary offence deny it he said of course not i remember joking her a little over something of the sort is that all this tremendous indignation is about a joke a joke she said indignantly you will not make any one but yourself merry over jokes like that you set to work deliberately to frighten her you did it so thoroughly that she has been wretched for days and days ill and miserable with the dread of being sent to prison you did threaten her with a prison harold you told her she must even be afraid of her own father of all of us who can tell what she has been suffering all alone my poor little dolly and you dare to call that a joke i never thought she would take it all so literally he said oh you are not stupid harold only a cruel fool could have thought he was doing no harm and you have seen her since again and again you must have noticed how changed she was and yet you had no pity on her can't you really see what a thing you have been doing do you often amuse yourself in that way and with children hang it mabel said caffyn uneasily you're very hard on me why were you hard on my darling dolly mabel demanded what had she done to you how could you find pleasure in torturing her do you hate children or only dolly he made a little gesture of impatient helplessness oh if you mean to go on asking questions like that he said of course i don't hate your poor little sister i tell you i'm sorry she took it seriously very sorry and and if there's anything i can do to make it up to her somehow any any amends you know the hardship as he felt at this time of his peculiar position was that it obliged him to offer such a lame excuse for his treatment of dolly without the motive he had had for his conduct it must seem dictated by some morbid impulse of cruelty 
whereas, of course, he had acted quite dispassionately, under the pressure of a necessity, which, however, it was impossible to explain to Mabel. "'I suppose amends mean caramels or chocolates,' said Mabel. "'Chocolates to compensate for making a child shrink for days from those who loved her. "'She was fretting herself ill, and we could do nothing for her. "'A very little more, and it might have killed her. "'Perhaps your sense of humour would have been satisfied by that. "'If it had not been for a friend, almost a stranger, "'who was able to see what we were all blind to, "'that a coward had been practising on her fears, "'we might never have guessed the truth till, till it was too late.' "'I see now,' he said. "'I thought there must be someone at the bottom of this, "'someone who, for purposes of his own, "'has contrived to put things in the worst light for me. "'If you can condescend to listen to slanders, Mabel, "'I shall certainly not condescend to defend myself.' "'Oh, I will tell you his name,' she said, "'and then even you will have to own "'that he had no motive for doing what he did "'but natural goodness and kindness. "'I doubt even if he has ever met you in his life,' The man who rescued our Dolly from what you have made her is Mr. Mark Ashburn, the author of Illusion. Her expression softened slightly from the gratitude she felt as she spoke his name, and Caffin noted it. If you think he would stoop to slander you! But what is the use of talking like that? You have owned it all. No slander could make it any worse than it is. "'If you think as badly of me as that,' said Caffin, who had grown deadly pale, "'we can meet no more, even as acquaintances.' "'That would be my own wish,' she replied. "'Do you mean,' he asked huskily, "'that—that that everything is to be over between us? "'Has it really come to that, Mabel? "'I did not know that there was ever anything between us, as you call it,' she said. "'But of course, after this, friendship is impossible we cannot help meeting i shall not even tell my mother of this for dolly's sake and so this house will still be open to you but if you force me to protect dolly or myself you will come here no more her scornful indifference only filled him with a more furious desire to triumph over it he had felt so secure of her that morning and now she had placed this immeasurable distance between them he had never felt the full power of her beauty till then, as she stood there with that haughty pose of the head and the calm contempt in her eyes. He had seen her in most moods, playfully perverse, coldly civil, and unaffectedly gracious and gentle, and in none of them had she made his heart ache with the mad passion that mastered him now. "'It shall not end like this,' he said violently. I won't let him make a mountain of a molehill in this way, Mabel, because it suits you to do so. You have no right to judge me by what a child chooses to imagine I said. I judge you by the effects of what you did say. I can remember very well that you had a cruel tongue as a boy. You are quite able to torture a child with it still. It is your tongue that is cruel, he retorted, but you shall be just to me. I love you, Mabel, whether you like it or not. You shall not throw me off like this. Do you hear? You liked me well enough before all this. I will force you to think better of me. You shall own it one day. No, I'm mad to talk like this. I only ask you to forgive me, to let me hope still. He came forward as he spoke and tried to take her hands, but she put them quickly behind her. Don't dare to come nearer, she said. I thought I had made you feel something of what I think of you. "'What can I say more? Hope! Do you think I could ever trust a man capable of such deliberate wickedness as you have shown by that single action? A kind of malice that I hardly think can be human? No, you had better not hope for that. As for forgiving you, I can't even do that now. Some day, perhaps, when Dolly has quite forgotten, I may be able to forget too, but not till then. Have I made you understand yet? Is that enough?' Caffin was still standing where she had checked his advance. His face was very grey and drawn, and his eyes were fixed on the eastern rug at his feet. He gave a short, savage laugh. "'Well, yes,' he said. "'I think perhaps I have had enough at last. You have been kind enough to put your remarks very plainly. I hope, for your own sake, I may never have a chance of making you any return for all this.' 
"'I hope so, too,' she said. "'I think you would use it.' "'Thanks for your good opinion,' he said, as he went to the door. "'I shall do my best, if the time comes, to deserve it.' She had never faltered during the whole of this interview. A righteous anger had given her courage to declare all the scorn and indignation she felt. But now, as the front door closed upon him, the strength that had sustained her so long gave way all at once. She sank trembling into one of the low-cushioned chairs, and presently the reaction completed itself in tears, which she had not quite repressed when Dolly came in to look for her. To look for her. "'Has he gone?' she began, and then, as she saw her sister's face, "'Mabel, Harold hasn't been bullying you?' "'No, darling, no,' said Mabel, putting her arms round Dolly's waist. "'It's silly of me to cry, isn't it? "'But Harold will not trouble either of us again after this.' Meanwhile, Harold was striding furiously down the other side of the hill, in the direction of Kensal Green, paying very little heed to where his steps might be leading him, in the dull rage which made his brain whirl. Mabel's soft and musical voice— for it had not ceased to be that, even when her indignation was at its highest, rang still in his ears. He could not forget her bitter, scornful speeches. They were lashing and stinging him to the soul. He had indeed been hoist with his own petard. The very adroitness with which he had contrived to get rid of an inconvenient rival had only served to destroy his own chances for ever. He knew that never again would Mabel suffer him to approach her, on the old friendly footing it would be much if she could bring herself to treat him with ordinary civility he had lost her for ever and hated her accordingly from the bottom of his heart if i can ever humble you as you have humbled me to-day god help you my charming mabel he said to himself to think that that little fool of a child should have let out everything at the very moment when i had the game in my own hands I have to thank that distinguished novelist, Mr. Mark Ashburn, for that, though. He must trouble himself to put his spoke in my wheel, must he? I shan't forget it. I owe you one for that, my illustrious friend. And you're the sort of creditor I generally do pay in the long run. Only one thing gave him a gleam, not of comfort, precisely, but gloomy satisfaction. This manoeuvre with the letter had at least succeeded in keeping Holroyd apart from Mabel. "'He's just the fellow to think he's jilted and give her up without another line,' he thought. "'Shouldn't wonder if he's married out there. Miss Mabel won't have everything her own way.' He walked on, past the huge gasometers and furnaces of the gas company, and over the railway and canal bridges to the Harrow Road, when he turned mechanically to the right. His eyes saw nothing, neither the sluggish barges gliding through the greasy black stream on his right, nor the doleful string of hearses and mourning coaches which passed him on their way to or from the cemetery. It was with some surprise, as he began to take note of his surroundings again, that he found himself in Bayswater, and not far from his own rooms. He thought he might as well return to them as not, and as he reached the terrace in which he had taken lodgings, he saw a figure coming towards him that seemed familiar, and in whom, as he drew nearer, he recognised his uncle, mr anthony humpage he was in no mood to talk about indifferent topics just then and if his respected uncle had only had his back instead of his face towards him caffyn would have made no great effort to attract his attention as it was he gave him the heartiest and most dutiful of welcomes you don't mean to say you've actually been looking me up he began how lucky that i came up just then another second or two and i should have missed you come in and let me give you some lunch no my boy i can't stay long i was in the neighbourhood on business and i thought i'd see if you were at home i won't come up now i must get back to my station i waited for some time in those luxurious apartments of yours you see thinking you might come in suppose you walk a little way back with me eh if you've no other engagement couldn't have a better one said caffyn inwardly chafing but he always made a point of obliging his uncle and for once he had no reason to consider his time thrown away for as they walked on together in the direction of the Edgware Road, where the old gentleman intended to take the underground to King's Cross, Mr. Humpage, after some desultory conversation on various subjects, said suddenly, 
"'By the way, you know a good many of these writing fellows, Harold. "'Have you ever come across one called Mark Ashburn?' "'I've met him once,' said Caffin, and his brows contracted. "'Wrote this new book, Illusion, didn't he?' "'Yes, he did. Confound him,' said the other warmly, "'and then launched into the history of his wrongs. "'Perhaps I oughtn't to say it at my age,' he concluded, "'but I hate that fellow.' "'Do you, though?' said Caffin with a laugh. "'It's a singular coincidence, but so do I.' "'There's something wrong about him, too,' continued the old man. "'He's got a secret.' "'So have most of us,' thought his nephew. "'But what makes you think so?' he asked aloud, and waited for the answer with some interest. "'I saw it in the fellow's face. "'No young man with a clear record ever had such a look as he had when I came in. "'He was green with fear, sir, perfectly green.' "'Is that all?' and Caffin was slightly disappointed. "'You know, I don't think much of that. He might have taken you for a dun or an indignant parent or something of that sort. He may be one of those nervous fellows who start at anything, and you came there on purpose to give him a rowing, didn't you?' "'Don't talk to me,' said the old man impatiently. "'There's not much nervousness about him. He's as cool and impudent a rascal as ever I saw when he's nothing to fear. It was guilt, sir, guilt.' You remember that picture of the railway station and the look on the forger's face when the detectives lay hold of him at the carriage door? I saw that very look on young Ashburn's face before I'd spoken a dozen words. What were the words? said Caffin. Proceed, good uncle, as we say in our profession. You interest me much. I'm sure I forget what I said. I was out of temper, I remember that. I think I began by asking him for the real name of the author of the book. Again, Caffin was disappointed. Of course, he was in a funk then. He knew he had put you into it. So you say, at least. I've not read the book myself. It wasn't that at all, I tell you, persisted the old man obstinately. You weren't there, and I was. Do you think I don't know better than you? He's not the man to care for that. When he found out what I'd really come about, he was cool enough. No, no, he's robbed or forged or something at some time or other. Take my word for it. I only hope I shall live to see it brought home to him. I hope I find him at home when it is, said Caffin. These things generally find the culprits out in more senses than one, to use an old Joe Miller. He would look extremely well in the old Bailey dock. But this is utopian, uncle. Well, we shall see. I turn off here, so good-bye. If you meet that libelling scoundrel again, you remember what I've told you. Yes, I will, thought Caffin as he walked back alone. I must know more of my dear Ashburn, and if there happens to be a screw loose anywhere in my dear Ashburn's past, I shall do my humble best to give it a turn or two. It's a charming amusement to unmask the perfidious villain, as I suppose I must call myself after today. But it was hardly safe to do it if he has his reasons for wearing a domino himself. If I could only think that excellent uncle of mine had not found a mare's nest, and if I can only put that screw on. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of the Giant's Road by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 a parley with the enemy mr fladgate was one of those domestically inclined bachelors who are never really at ease in rooms or chambers and whose tastes lead them as soon as they possess the necessary means to set up a substantial and well-regulated household of their own he had a large old-fashioned house in the neighbourhood of russell square where he entertained rather frequently in a solid unpretentious fashion at his Sunday dinners especially, one or two of the minor celebrities of the day were generally to be met, and it was to one of these gatherings that Mark was invited, as one of the natural consequences of the success of illusion. He found himself, on arriving, in company with several faces familiar to him from photographs, and heard names announced which were already common property. There were some there who had been famous once and were already beginning to be forgotten others now obscure who were destined to be famous some day, and a few, and these by no means the least gifted, who neither had been nor would be famous at any time. 
there were two or three constellations of some magnitude on this occasion surrounded by a kind of milky way of minor stars amongst which the bar the studios and the stage were all more or less represented mark as a rising man who had yet to justify a first success occupied a position somewhere between the greater and lesser division and mr fladgate took care to make him known to many of the leading men in the room by whom he found himself welcomed with cordial encouragement presently when he had shifted for a moment out of the nearest focus of conversation his host who had been distributing himself as the french say amongst the various knots of talkers came bustling up to him er uh, mr ashburn he began i want you to know a very clever young fellow here known him from a boy he's on the stage now and going to surprise us all some of these days you'll like him come along and i'll introduce him to you he's very anxious to know you and when mark had followed him as he threaded his way across the room he found himself hurriedly introduced to the man with the cold light eyes whom he had met at the featherstones on the day when he had recognized mabel langton's portrait mr fladgate had already bustled away again and the two were left together in a corner of the room dolly's revelations of the terrorism this man had exercised over her had strengthened the prejudice and dislike mark had felt on their first meeting he felt angry and a little uncomfortable now at being forced to come in contact with him but there was no way of avoiding it just then and caffin himself was perfectly at his ease i think we have met before at grosvenor place he began blandly but i dare say you have forgotten no said mark i remember you very well and besides he added with a significance that he hoped would not be thrown away i have been hearing a good deal about you lately from the langtons from miss langton that is ah said caffin that would be flattering to most men but when one has the bad luck like myself to displease such a very impulsive young lady as miss langton the less she mentions you the better i might as well say returned mark coldly that as to that particular affair in which you were concerned whatever my opinions are i formed them without assistance and you don't care to have them unsettled again by any plea for the defence that's very natural well with miss langton's remarks to guide me i think i can guess what your own opinions of me is likely to be just now and i'm going to ask you as a mere matter of fair play to hear my side of the question you think that's very ridiculous of course i think we can do no good by discussing it any further said mark we had better let the matter drop but you see urged caffin as it is the matter has dropped on me and really i do think that you who i understand were the means of course from the best possible motives of exposing me as a designing villain might give me an opportunity of defending myself i took the liberty of getting fladgate to bring us together expressly because i can't be comfortable while i know you have your present impressions of me i don't expect to persuade miss langton to have a little charity she's a woman but i hoped you at least would give me a hearing mark felt some of his prejudice leaving him already caffin had not the air of a man who had been detected in a course of secret tyranny there was something flattering too in his evident wish to recover mark's good opinion he certainly ought to hear both sides before judging so harshly perhaps after all they had been making a little too much of this business well he said at last i should be very glad if i could think things were not as bad as they seem i will hear anything you would like to say about it quite the high moral censor thought the other savagely confound his condescension i was sure you would give me a chance of putting myself right he said but i can't do it now they're going down to dinner we will talk it over afterwards at dinner conversation was lively and well sustained though perhaps not quite so sparkling as might have been expected from such an assembly as a rule those who talked most and best were the men who still had their reputation to make and many of the great men there seemed content to expose themselves to such brilliancy as there was around them as if silently absorbing it for future reproduction by some process analogous to the action of luminous paint caffin was placed at some distance from mark and as after dinner he was entreated to sit down to the piano 
which stood in the corner of the room to which they had adjourned for cigars and coffee it was some time before their conversation was resumed caffin was at his best as he sat there rippling out snatches of operatic morceaux and turning round with a smile to know if they were recognised his performance was not remarkable for accuracy as he had never troubled himself to study music or anything else seriously but it was effective enough with a non-critical audience his voice too when he sang though scarcely strong enough to fill a room of much larger size was pleasant and not untrained and it was some time before he was permitted to leave the music stool he rattled off a rollicking hunting song full of gaiety and verve and followed it up with a little pathetic ballad sung with an accent of real feeling he could throw more emotion into his singing than his acting while although it was after dinner the room was hushed until the last notes had died away and when he rose at length with a laughing plea of exhaustion he was instantly surrounded by a buzz of genuine gratitude mark heard all this and the last remnants of his dislike and distrust vanished it seemed impossible that this man with the sympathetic voice and the personal charm which was felt by most of those present could be capable of finding pleasure in working on a child's terrors so that when caffin disengaging himself at length from the rest made his way to where mark was sitting the latter felt this almost as a distinction and made room for him with cordiality somebody was at the piano again but as all around were talking the most confidential conversations could be carried on in perfect security and caffin seating himself next to mark set himself to remove all prejudices he put his case very well without obsequiousness or temper appealing to mark as a fellow man of the world against a girl's rash judgment you know he said in the course of his arguments i'm not really an incarnate fiend in private life miss langton is quite convinced i am i believe i saw her looking suspiciously at my boots the other day but then she's a trifle hard on me my worst fault is that i don't happen to understand children i'd got into a way of saying extravagant things you know the way one does talk rubbish to children well of joking in that sort of way with little what's her name she always seemed to understand it well enough and i should have thought she was old enough to see the simpler kind of joke at all events one day i chanced to chaff her about a stamp she took off some envelope well i dare say i said something about stealing and prisons all in fun of course never dreaming she would think any more of it a fortnight afterwards suddenly there's a tremendous hullabaloo you began it oh i know it was natural enough but you did begin it you see the child looking pale and seedy and say at once something on her mind well i don't know and she might have been such a little idiot as to take a chance word au grand sérieux it might have been something else on her mind or she mightn't have had anything on her mind at all anyway she tells you a long story about prisons and how one harold caffin has told her she would go there and so on and you with that vivid imagination of yours conjure up a tearful picture of a diabolical young man me you know coldly gloating over the terrors of a poor little innocent ignorant child eh miss dolly's nearly ten and anything but backward for her age but that's of no consequence well then you go and impart some of your generous indignation to miss langton she takes it in a very aggravated form and gives it to me upon my word i think i've had rather hard lines mark really felt a little remorseful just then but he made one more attempt to maintain his high ground i don't know that i should have thought so much of the joke itself he said but you carried it on so long you saw her brooding over it and getting worse and worse and yet you never said a word to undeceive the poor child now you know with all respect to you ashburn said caffin who was gradually losing all ceremony that about seeing her brooding is rubbish pure rubbish i saw the child i suppose now and again but i didn't notice her particularly and if i had i don't exactly know how to detect the signs of brooding how do you tell it from indigestion and how are you to guess what the brooding is about i tell you i'd forgotten the whole thing and that was what all your righteous wrath was based upon was it well it's very delightful no doubt to figure as a knight-errant 
or a champion and all that kind of thing particularly when you make your own dragon but when you come prancing down and spit some unlucky lizard it's rather a cheap triumph but there i forgive you you've made a little mistake which has played the very deuce with me at kensington park gardens it's too late to alter that now and if i can only make you see that there has been a mistake and i'm not one of the venomous sorts of reptiles after all why i suppose i must be content with that he succeeded in giving mark an uneasy impression that he had made a fool of himself he had quite lost the feeling of superiority under the tone of half humorous half bitter remonstrance which caffyn had chosen to take and was chiefly anxious now to make the other forget his share in the matter perhaps i was too ready to put the worst construction on what i heard he said apologetically but after what you've told me why well we'll say no more about it said caffyn you understand me now and that's all i cared about you may be a great genius my friend he was thinking but it's not so very difficult to get round you after all look here he continued will you come and see me one of these days it would be a great kindness to me i've got rooms in kremlin road bayswater number seventy two mark changed countenance very slightly as he heard the address it had been holroyd's there was nothing in that to alarm him and yet he could not resist a superstitious terror at the coincidence caffyn noticed the effect directly do you know kremlin road he said something made mark anxious to explain the emotion he felt he had given way to yes he said uh, a very old friend of mine had lodgings at that very house he was lost at sea so when you mentioned the place i uh, i see said caffyn of course was your friend vincent holroyd i wonder you knew him cried mark you got the railway station effect that time thought caffyn i begin to believe my dear uncle touched a weak spot after all if he has a secret it's ten to one holroyd knew it knows it by jove oh yes i knew poor old holroyd he said that's how i came to take his rooms sad thing his going down like that wasn't it it must have been a great shock for you i can see you haven't got over it even yet no stammered mark no yes i felt it a great deal i uh, i didn't know you were a friend of his too did did you know him well very well in fact i don't fancy he had any secrets from me like lightning the thought flashed across mark's mind what if caffyn had been entrusted with holroyd's literary projects but he remembered the next moment that holroyd had expressly said that he had never told a soul of his cherished work until that last evening in rotten row caffyn had lied but with purpose and as the result confirmed his suspicions he changed the subject and was amused at mark's evident relief towards the end of the evening mr fladgate came up in his amiable way and laid his hand jocularly on caffyn's shoulder let me give you a word of advice he said laughing don't talk to mr ashburn here about his book shouldn't presume to said caffyn but do you come down so heavily on ignorant admiration ashburn eh oh it isn't that said mr fladgate it's his confounded modesty i shall be afraid to tell him when we think about bringing out another edition i really believe he'd like never to hear of it again mark felt himself flush come he said with a nervous laugh i'm not so bad as all that oh you're beginning to stand fire better but it's such a good story you must let me tell it mr ashburn particularly as it only does you credit well he was so ashamed of having it known that he was the author of illusion that he actually took the trouble to get the manuscript all copied out in a different hand thought he'd take me in that way but he didn't no no as you young fellows say i spotted him directly eh mr ashburn i'm afraid it's time for me to be off said mark dreading further revelations and too nervous to see that they could do no possible harm but the fact was caffyn's presence filled him with a vague alarm which he could not shake off good-natured mr fladgate was afraid he had offended him 
"'I do hope you weren't annoyed at my mentioning that about the manuscript,' he said, as he accompanied Mark to the door. "'It struck me as so curious, considering the success the book has had, that I really couldn't resist telling it.' "'No, no,' said Mark. "'It's all right. I don't mind in the least. I, I'm not ashamed of it.' "'Why, of course not,' said his host. "'It will be something for your biographer to record, eh? "'You won't have another cigar to take you home? "'Well, good night.' "'Good night,' said Mark, "'and added some words of thanks for a pleasant evening.' "'Had he had such a pleasant evening?' "'He asked himself as he walked home alone "'in the warm night air. "'He had been well treated by everybody.' and there had been men present whose attention was a distinction in itself, and yet he felt an uneasiness which he found it difficult to trace back to any particular cause. He decided at last that he was annoyed to find that the casual mention of Holroyd's name should still have power to discompose him. That was a weakness which he must set himself to overcome. At the same time, no one could possibly discover his secret. There was no harm done and before he reached his lodgings, he decided that the evening had been pleasant enough. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of The Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Striking the Trail It was Sunday once more a bright morning in june and caffyn was sitting over his late breakfast and the observer in his rooms in bayswater he was in a somewhat gloomy and despondent frame of mind for nothing seemed to have gone well with him since his disastrous reception in mabel's boudoir his magnificent prospects in commerce had suddenly melted away into thin air for his confiding friend and intending partner had very inconsiderately developed symptoms of a premature insanity and was now under restraint he himself was in debt to a considerable extent his father had firmly refused to increase what in his opinion was a handsome allowance and caffyn had been obliged to go to a theatrical agent with a view of returning to the boards while no opening he thought it worth his while to accept had as yet presented itself mabel had not relented in the least he had met her once or twice at the Featherstones, and, although she had not treated him with any open coolness, he felt that henceforth there must be an impassable barrier between them. Now and then, even while she forced herself in public to listen to him, the invincible horror and repugnance she felt would be suddenly revealed by a chance look or intonation, and he saw it and writhed in secret, and yet he went everywhere that there was a possibility of meeting her with a restless impulse of self-torture while his hate grew more intense day by day and all this he owed to mark ashburn a fact which harold caffyn was not the man to forget he had been careful to cultivate him had found out his address and paid him one or two visits in which he had managed to increase the intimacy between them mark was now entirely at his ease with him his air of superiority had been finally dropped on the evening of Mr. Fladgate's dinner, and he seemed flattered by the assiduity with which Caffyn courted his society. Still, if he had a secret, it was his own still. Caffyn watched in vain for the look of sudden terror which he had once succeeded in surprising. At times he began to feel that it was some involuntary nervous contraction from which his own hopes had led him to infer the worst for he was aware that countenances are not always to be depended upon that a nervous temperament will sometimes betray all the signs of guilt from the mere consciousness that guilt is suspected if that was the case here he felt himself powerless it is only in melodramas that a well-conducted person can be steeped in crime and he did not see his way very clearly to accomplishing that difficult and dangerous feat with mark ashburn so he hated mark more intensely at the thought that after all his past might be a blameless one but even if this were not so and he had a secret after all it might be long enough before some fortunate chance gave caffyn the necessary clue to it 
well he would wait and watch as patiently as he might till then and however long the opportunity might be in coming when it came at last it should not find him too indifferent or reluctant to make use of it while he thought out his position somewhat to this effect his landlady appeared to clear away the breakfast things she was a landlady of the better class a motherly old soul who prided herself upon making her lodgers comfortable and had higher views than many of her kind on the subjects of cookery and attendance she had come to entertain a great respect for caffyn although at first when she had discovered that he was one of them play-actors she had not been able to refrain from misgivings her notions of actors were chiefly drawn from the ramping and roaring performers at minor theatres and the seedy blue-chinned individual she had observed hanging about their stage doors and the modern comedian was altogether beyond her experience so when she found that her new lodger was quite the gentleman and that particular about his linen and always civil and pleasant spoken and going about as neat as a new pin and yet with a way about him as you could see he wouldn't stand no nonsense her prejudices were entirely conquered good morning mr caffyn sir she began i come up to clear away your breakfast if you're quite done sarah ann she's gone to chapel and she's a primitive methodist she says though she can't never tell me so much as the text when she comes back and i tell her my good gal i says to her what do you go to chapel for and it's my belief that as often as not she don't go near it but there mr caffyn if a gal does her work about the house of a week as i will say for sarah ann caffyn groaned good mrs binney had a way of coming in to discourse on things in general and it was always extremely difficult to get rid of her she did not run down on this occasion until after an exhaustive catalogue a la mrs lirriper on the manners and customs of a whole dynasty of maids of all work when she began to clear his breakfast-table he was congratulating himself on her final departure when she returned with a bundle of papers in her hand i've been meaning to speak to you about these this ever such a time she said binney he said as i'd better seeing as you've got his very rooms and me not liking to burn em and the maid's that careless about papers and that and not a line from him since he left it would certainly be better not to burn the rooms unless they're insured mrs binney and i should be inclined to prefer their not being burnt while i'm in them unless you make a point of it said caffyn mildly lor mr caffyn who was talking of burning rooms you do talk so ridiculous it's these loose papers of mr olroyd's as i came to speak to you about you been a friend of his and they lie a burden on my mind for many a day and littering up all the place and so afraid i am a sarah ann'll take and light the fire with one of em these mornings and who knows whether they're not of value and if so what should i say if he came and asked me for em back again well he won't do that mrs binney if it's true he was drowned in the mangalore will he drowned i mean never to hear it till this day it's quite took me aback poor dear gentleman what an end for him to go out all that way only to be drowned i do seem to be told of nothing but deaths and dying this morning for binney's just heard that poor old mr tapling at number five opposite was took off at last quite sudden late last night and he'd had a dropsy for years and swell up he would into all manners of shapes as i've seen him doing of it myself well i'll look over the papers for you mrs binney interrupted caffyn i don't suppose there's anything of much importance but i can tell you what ought to be kept he would have solved her difficulties by advising her to burn the whole of them but for some vague idea that he might be able to discover something amongst all these documents which would throw some light upon holroyd's relations with mark so when mrs binney was at last prevailed on to leave him in peace he sat down with the sheaf of miscellaneous papers she had left him and began to examine them without much hope of discovering anything to the purpose they seemed to be the accumulations of some years there were rough drafts of latin and greek verses outlines for essays and hasty jottings of university and temple lectures memorials of holroyd's undergraduate and law student days then came notes scribbled down in court with a blunt corroded quill on borrowed scraps of paper 
and elaborate analyses of leading cases and acts of parliament which belonged to the period of zeal which had followed his call to the bar he turned all these over carelessly enough until he came upon some sheets fastened together with a metal clip this does not look like law he said half aloud glamour romance by vincent beecham beecham was his second name i think so he wrote romances did he poor devil this looks like the scaffolding for one anyway let's have a look at it list of characters bowmel marston i've come across that name somewhere lately i know lieutenant colonel duncombe why i know that gentleman too was this ever published here's the argument he read and re-read it carefully and then went to a bookshelf and took down a book with the grosvenor library label it was a copy of illusion by cyril ernstone with that by his side he turned over the rest of holroyd's papers and found more traces of some projected literary work skeleton scenes headings for chapters and even a few of the opening pages with some marginal alterations in red ink all of which he eagerly compared with the printed work before him then he rose and paced excitedly up and down his room is this his secret he thought if i could only be sure of it it seems too good to be true they might have collaborated or the other might have made him a present of a plot or even borrowed some notions from him and yet there are some things that look uncommonly suspicious why should he look so odd at the mere mention of holroyd's name why did he get the manuscript recopied was it modesty or something else and why does one name only appear on the title page and our dear friend take all the credit to himself there's something fishy about it all and i mean to get at it job was perfectly correct it is rash for an enemy to put his name to a book especially some other fellow's book mr mark ashburn and i must have a little private conversation together in which i shall see how much i remember of the action of the common pump he sat down and wrote a genial little note asking mark if he had no better engagement to come round and dine quietly with him at the house in kremlin road that evening gave it to his landlord with directions to take a cab to mark's rooms and if he could bring back an answer after which he waited patiently for his messenger's return binney returned in the course of an hour or so having found mark in and brought a note which caffyn tore open impatiently i have a friend coming to dinner to-night mr binney he said turning round with his pleasant smile when he had read the answer it's sunday i know but mrs binney won't mind for once and tell her she must do her very best i want to give my friend a little surprise End of chapter twenty two Chapter twenty three of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three Piano Practice. Caffin was conscious of a certain excitement that Sunday evening as he waited for Mark Ashburn's arrival. He felt that he might be standing on the threshold of a chamber containing the secret of the other's life, the key of which that very evening might deliver into his hands he was too cautious to jump at hasty conclusions he wished before deciding upon any plan of action to be practically certain of his facts a little skilful manipulation however would most probably settle the question one way or the other and if the result verified his suspicions he thought he would know how to make use of his advantage there is a passage in the autocrat of the breakfast-table where the author in talking of the key to the side door by which every person's feelings may be entered goes on to say if nature or accident has put one of these keys into the hands of a person who has the torturing instinct i can only solemnly pronounce the words that justice utters over its doomed victims the lord have mercy on your soul there it is true the key in question unlocks the delicate instrument of the nervous system and not necessarily a bluebeard's chamber of guilt 
but where the latter is also the case to some extent the remark by no means loses in significance and if any man had the torturing instinct to perfection caffyn might be said to be that individual there was nothing he would enjoy more than practising upon a human piano and putting it hopelessly out of tune but pleasant as this was he felt he might have to exercise some self-denial here at all events for the present lest his instrument should become restive and escape before he had quite made up his mind what air he could best play on it in the meantime mark was preparing to keep the appointment in the pleasantest and most unsuspecting frame of mind after answering caffyn's note he had met the langtons as they came out of church and returned with them to lunch dolly was herself again now her haunting fears forgotten with the happy ease of childhood and mabel had made mark feel something of the gratitude she felt to him for his share in bringing this about he had gone on to one or two other houses and had been kindly received everywhere and now he was looking forward to a quiet little dinner with the full expectation of a worthy finish to a pleasant day even when he mounted the stairs of the house which had been once familiar to him and stood in holroyd's old rooms he was scarcely affected by any unpleasant associations for one thing he was beginning to have his conscience tolerably well in hand for another the interior of the rooms was completely transformed since he had seen them last then they were simply the furnished apartments of a man who cared but little for his personal well-being now when he passed round the handsome japanese screen by the door he saw an interior marked by a studied elegance and luxury the common lodging-house fireplace was concealed by an elaborate oak overmantel with brass plaques and blue china the walls were covered with a delicate blue-green paper and hung with expensive etchings and autotype drawings of an aesthetically erotic character small tables and deep luxurious chairs were scattered about and near the screen stood a piano and a low stand with peacock's feathers arranged in a pale blue crackle jar in spite of the pipes and riding whips on the racks the place was more like a woman's boudoir than a man's room and there were traces in its arrangements of an eye to effect which gave it the air of a well-staged scene in a modern comedy it looked very attractive softly lit as it was by shaded candles in sconces and a porcelain lamp with a crimson shade which was placed on the small oval table near the fern-filled fireplace and as mark placed himself in a low steamer chair and waited for his host to make his appearance he felt as if he was going to enjoy himself i shall have my rooms done up something in this way he thought when my book comes out the blinds were half drawn and the windows opened wide to the sultry air and while he waited he could hear the bells from neighbouring steeples calling in every tone from harsh command to persuasive invitation to the evening services presently caffyn lounged in through the hangings which protected his bedroom door sorry you found me unready he said i got in late from the club somehow but they'll bring us up some dinner presently looking at that thing eh he asked as he saw mark's eye rest on a small high-heeled satin slipper in a glass case which stood on a bracket near him that was kitty bessborough's once you remember kitty bessborough of course she gave it to me just before she went out on that american tour and got killed in some big railway smash somewhere poor little woman i'll tell you some day how she came to make me a present of it here's binney with the soup now mrs binney sent up a perfect dinner at which her husband assisted in a swallow-tailed coat and white tie a concession he would not have made for every lodger and caffyn played the host to perfection though with every course he asked himself inwardly shall i open fire on him yet and still he delayed at last he judged that his time had come binney had brought up coffee and left them alone you sit down there and make yourself at home said caffyn genially thrusting mark down into a big saddle-bag armchair where i can see your confounded face he added inwardly try one of these cigars they're not bad and now we can talk comfortably i'll tell you what i want to talk to you about he said presently and a queer smile flitted across his face i want to talk to you about that book of yours 
oh i know you want to fight shy of it but i don't care it isn't often i have a celebrated author to dine with me and if you didn't wish to hear it talked about you shouldn't have written it you know i want you to tell me a few facts i can retail to people on the best authority don't you know so you must just make up your mind to conquer that modesty of yours for once old fellow and gratify my impertinent curiosity mark was feeling so much at ease with himself and caffyn that even this proposition was not very terrible to him just then all right he said lazily what do you want to know first that's right well first i must tell you i've read the book i'd like to say how much i was struck by it if i might i'm very glad you liked it said mark like it echoed caffyn my dear fellow i haven't been so moved by anything for years the thought you've crammed into that book the learning the passion and feeling of the thing i envy you for being able to feel you have produced it all that ought to fetch him he thought oh as for that said mark with a shrug and left his remark unfinished but without as the other noticed betraying any particular discomposure do you remember now pursued caffyn how the central idea first occurred to you but here again he drew a blank for mark had long ago found it expedient to concoct a circumstantial account of how and when the central idea had first occurred to him well i'll tell you he said it shows how oddly these things are brought about i was walking down palace gardens one afternoon and he told the history of the conception of illusion in his best manner until caffyn raged internally you brazen humbug he thought to sit there and tell that string of lies to me when it was finished he remarked well that's very interesting and i have your permission to tell that again eh certainly my dear fellow said mark with a wave of his hand his cigar was a really excellent one and he thought he would try another presently we must try him again thought caffyn he's deeper than i gave him credit for being i'll tell you an odd criticism i heard the other day i was talking to little mrs bismuth you know mrs bismuth by name some fellow has just taken the charivari for her well she goes in for letters a little as well as the drama reads no end of light literature since she gave up tights for drawing-room comedy and she would have it that she seemed to recognize two distinct styles in the book as if two pens had been at work on it now i may find out if that really was the case after all he was thinking i thought you'd be amused with that he added after a pause mark really did seem amused he laughed a little mrs bismuth is a charming actress he said but she'd better read either a little more or a little less light literature before she goes in for tracing differences in style you can tell her with my compliments that a good many pens were at work on it but only one brain where is it your matches live i can't draw him thought caffyn what an actor the fellow is and yet if it was all above board he wouldn't have said that and i've got holroyd's handwriting which is pretty strong evidence against him but i want more and i'll have it he strolled up to the mantelpiece to light a cigarette for which purpose he removed the shade from one of the candles throwing a stronger light on his friend's face and then pausing with the cigarette still unlighted between his fingers he asked suddenly by the way flagate said some other fellow wrote the book for you the other day that shot at least told every vestige of colour left mark's face he half rose from his chair and then sat down again as he retorted sharply flagate said that what the devil are you talking about what fellow why you were there when he said it some amanuensis you gave the manuscript to the colour came back in rather an increased quantity to mark's cheeks what a nervous fool he was oh ah uh, that fellow he said i remember now yes i was absurdly anxious to remain unknown you see in those days and and i rather wanted to put something in the way of a poor fellow who got his living by copying manuscripts and so you see i see said caffyn what was his name his name repeated mark who had not expected this and had no name ready for such immediate use 
let me see i almost forget it began with a b i know brown brun something like that i really don't recollect just now but the fact is he added with a desperate recourse to detail the first time i saw the beggar he looked so hard up dressed in buckram thought caffin but he said nothing in rags you know that i felt it would be quite a charity to employ him so it is agreed caffin did he write a good hand i might be able to give him some work myself in copying out parts oh he'd be useless for that put in mark with some alarm he wrote a wretched hand well but in the cause of charity you know rejoined caffin with inward delight hang it ashburn why shouldn't i do an unselfish thing as well as you what's the fellow's address he he's emigrated said mark you'll find it rather difficult to come across him now should i caffin returned well i dare say i should and mark rose and went to one of the windows for some air he remained there for a short time looking idly down the darkening street a chapel opposite was just discharging its congregation and he found entertainment in watching the long-lighted ground glass windows as a string of grotesque silhouettes filed slowly across them like a shadow pantomime turned serious when he was tired of that and turned away from the blue-gray dusk the luxurious comfort of the room struck him afresh you've made yourself uncommonly comfortable here he said appreciatively as he settled down again in his velvet pile chair well i flatter myself i've improved the look of the place since you saw it last poor holroyd you see never cared to go in for this kind of thing queer reserved fellow wasn't he very said mark and then with the perverse impulse which drives us to test dangerous ice he said didn't you say though the other evening that he had no secrets from you trying to pump me are you thought the other but you don't did i he answered sometimes i fancy now and then that i knew less of him than i thought i did for instance he was very busy for a long time before he left england over something or other but he never told me what it was i used to catch him writing notes and making extracts and so on you were a great friend of his ashburn weren't you do you happen to know whether he was engaged on some work which would account for that now did he ever mention to you that he was writing a book for instance never said mark did he did he hint that to you never got a word out of him but i dare say you who knew him best will laugh when i tell you this i always had my suspicions that he was writing a novel a novel echoed mark holroyd excuse me my dear fellow i really can't help laughing it does seem such a comic idea and he laughed boisterously overcome by the humour of the notion until caffin said well i didn't know him as well as you did i suppose but i shouldn't have thought it was so devilish funny as all that for caffin was a little irritated that the other should believe him to be duped by all this and that he could not venture as yet to undeceive him it made him viciously inclined to jerk the string harder yet and watch mark's contortions he wasn't that sort of man said mark when he had had his laugh out poor dear fellow he'd have been as amused at the idea as i am but this success of yours would have pleased him wouldn't it said caffin for a moment mark was cut as deeply by this as the speaker intended he could give no other answer than a sigh which was perfectly genuine caffin affected to take this as an expression of incredulity surely you don't doubt that he said why holroyd would have been as glad as if he had written the book himself if he could come back to us again you would see that i am right what a meeting it would be if one could only bring it about it's no use talking like that said mark rather sharply holroyd's dead poor fellow at the bottom of the indian ocean somewhere we shall never meet again but said caffin with his eyes greedily watching mark's face even these things happen sometimes he may come back to congratulate you still how do you mean he's drowned i tell you the dead never come back the dead don't returned caffin significantly do you you don't mean to tell me he's alive 
"'If I were to say yes,' said Caffin, "'I wonder how you would take it.' If he had any doubts still remaining, the manner in which Mark received these words removed them. He fell back in his seat with a gasp and turned a ghastly lead colour. Then, with an evident effort, he leaned forward again, clutching the arms of the chair, and his voice was hoarse and choked when he was able to make use of it. "'You have heard something,' he said. "'What is it? Why can't you tell it? Out with it, man! For God's sake, don't! Don't play with me like this!' Caffin felt a wild exultation he had the greatest difficulty in repressing. He could not resist enjoying Mark's evident agony a little longer. "'Don't excite yourself, my dear fellow,' he said calmly. "'I oughtn't to have said anything about it.' "'I'm not excited,' said Mark. "'See, I'm quite cool. Tell me all you know. He, He's alive, then? You have heard from him? I, I can't bear it.' "'No, no,' said Caffin. "'You're deceiving yourself. "'You mustn't let yourself hope, Ashburn. "'I have never heard from him from that day to this. "'You know yourself that he was not in any of the boats. "'There's no real chance of his having survived.' "'For it was not his policy to alarm Mark too far, "'and least of all to show his hand so early. "'His experiment had been successful. "'He now knew all he wanted, and was satisfied with that.' Mark's face relaxed into an expression of supreme relief. Then it became suspicious again as he asked, almost in a whisper, "'I thought that. But then, why did you say all that about the dead, about coming back?' "'You mustn't be angry if I tell you. I didn't know you cared so much about him, or I wouldn't have done it. You know what some literary fellow—is it Tennyson? says somewhere about our showing a precious cold shoulder to the dead if they were injudicious enough to turn up again. Those aren't the exact words, but that's the idea. Well, I was thinking whether, if a poor fellow like poor Holroyd were to come back now, he'd find anyone to care a pin about him. And as you were his closest friend, I thought I'd try how you took it. It was thoughtless, I know. I never dreamed it would affect you in this way. You're as white as chalk still. It's quite knocked you over. I'm really very sorry." "'It was not a friendly thing to do,' said Mark, recovering himself. "'It was not kind, when one has known a man so long and believed him dead, and then to be made to believe that he is still alive, it—it—' it, "'You can't wonder if I look rather shaken.' "'I don't,' said Caffin. "'I quite understand. "'He has not quite forgotten after all, then. "'He still has a faithful friend in you to remember him, "'and he's been dead six months. "'How many of us can hope for that?' "'You must have been very fond of him.' "'Very,' with a sad self-loathing as he spoke the lie. "'I shall never see anyone like him. Never.' "'How well he does it, after all,' thought Caffin. "'I shall have plenty of sport with him.' "'Would it give you any comfort to talk about him now and then?' he suggested, "'with one who knew him, too, though not as well, perhaps, as you did.' "'Thanks,' said Mark. "'I think it would some day, but not yet.' "'I don't feel quite up to it at present.' "'Well,' said the other, with a wholly private grin, "'I won't distress you by talking of him till you introduce the subject. "'And you quite forgive me for saying what I did, don't you?' "'Quite,' said Mark. "'And now I think I'll say good-night.' The horror of those few moments in which he had seen detection staring him in the face still clung to him as he walked back to his lodgings. He cursed his folly in ever having exposed himself to such tremendous risks, until he remembered that, after all, his situation remained the same. He had merely been frightened with false fire. If he had not been very sure that the dead would never rise to denounce him, he would not have done what he had done. How could Vincent Holroyd have escaped? Still, it was an ugly thought, and it followed him to his pillow that night and gave him fearful dreams. He was in a large gathering, and Mabel was there, too. He could see her at the other end of an immense hall, and through the crowd Holroyd was slowly, steadily making his way to her side, and Mark knew his object. It was to denounce him. If he could only reach him first, he felt that somehow he could prevent him from gaining his end, and he made frantic efforts to do so but always the crowd hedged him in and blocked his way with a stupid impassibility, and he struggled madly, but all in vain. 
Holroyd drew nearer and nearer Mabel, with that stern, set purpose in his face, while Mark himself was powerless to move or speak, and so the dream dragged itself on all through the night. He had some thoughts on waking of setting his fears to rest forever by making some further inquiries, but when he read once more the various accounts he had preserved of the shipwreck, he convinced himself willingly enough that nothing of the kind was necessary. He could dismiss the matter from his mind once for all, and by breakfast time he was himself again. Caffin, now that his wildest hopes of revenge were realised, and he saw himself in a position to make terrible reprisals for the injury Mark Ashburn had done him, revelled in a delicious sense of power, the only drawback to his complete enjoyment of the situation being his uncertainty as to the precise way of turning his knowledge to the best account. Should he turn upon Mark suddenly with the intimation that he had found him out, without mentioning as yet that Holroyd was in the land of the living? There would be exquisite pleasure in that, and what a field for the utmost ingenuity of malice in constant reminders of the hold he possessed, in veiled threats and vague mocking promises of secrecy. Could any enemy desire a more poignant retribution? He longed to do all this, and no one could have done it better, but he was habitually inclined to mistrust his first impulses, and he feared lest his victim might grow weary of writhing. He might be driven to despair, to premature confession, flight, suicide, perhaps. He was just the man to die by his own hand and leave a letter cursing him as his torturer, to be read at the inquest and get into all the papers. No, he would not go too far. For the present he decided to leave Mark in happy ignorance of the ruin tottering above him. He would wait until he was even more prosperous, more celebrated, before taking any decisive steps. There was little fear that he would see his revenge some day, and meanwhile he must be content with such satisfaction as he could enjoy in secret. "'I must put up with the fellow a little longer,' he thought. "'We will go on mourning our dear lost friend together, until I can arrange a meeting somehow. A telegram or letter to the Ceylon plantation will fetch him at any time, and I don't care about doing my charming Mabel such a good turn as bringing him back to her just yet. I wonder how my worthy plagiarist is feeling after last night. I think I will go round and have a look at him. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four A Meeting in Germany. The summer went by, and Mark's anticipations of happiness were as nearly borne out as such anticipations ever are. He and Mabel met constantly. He saw her in the row with her father and Dolly and sometimes had the bliss of exchanging a few words across the railings, at dances and tennis parties, and in most of the less exclusive events of the season, while every interview left him more deeply infatuated. She seemed always glad to see him and talk with him, allowing herself to express a decided interest in his doings, and never once throwing on him the burden of a conversational deadlift, in the manner with which a girl knows how to discourage all but the dullest of bores. Now and then, indeed, when Mark's conversation showed symptoms of the occasional inanity common to most men who talk much, she did not spare him, but this was due to a jealous anxiety on her part that he should keep up to his own standard, and if she had not liked him, she would not have taken the trouble. He took her light shafts so patiently, and good-humouredly, too, that she was generally seized by a contrition which expressed itself in renewed graciousness. Already she had come to notice his arrival on lawns or in drawing-rooms, and caught herself remembering his looks and words after their meeting. He was still busy with sweet bells jangled, for he had now decided to make his coup with that, but in other respects he was unproductive. He had begun several little things in pursuance of his engagements, but somehow he did not get on with them, and had to lay them aside until the intellectual thaw he expected. Pecuniarily, his position was much improved. His uncle had kept his word and put an allowance at his disposal, 
which made him tolerably easy about his future he removed to more fashionable quarters in south audley street and led the easy existence there he had long coveted still mr lightowler was an unpleasantly constant bluebottle in his ointment he came up regularly from chigbourne to inspect him generally with literary advice and the latest scandal about his detested neighbour which he thought might be worked up into something he had discovered the row as an afternoon lounge where his nephew ought to show himself among the swells and he insisted in spite of all mark's attempts at evasion in walking him about there mark was not perhaps exactly ashamed of the man whose favours he was accepting at least he did not own as much even to himself but there were times when as he met the surprised glances of people he knew slightly he could have wished that his loud-voiced and unpresentable relative had not got quite such a tight hold of his arm at a hint from trixie he had tendered the olive branch to his family which they accepted rather as if it had been something he had asked them to hold for him and without the slightest approach to anything like a scene trixie had of course been in communication with him from the first and kept her satisfaction to herself mr ashburn was too timid and his wife too majestic to betray emotion while the other two were slightly disappointed the virtuous members of a family are not always best pleased to see the prodigal at any time and it is particularly disconcerting to find that the supposed outcast has been living on veal instead of husks during his absence and associating rather with lions than swine mark was not offended at his reception however he felt himself independent now but his easy temper made him anxious to be at peace with them and if they were not exactly effusive they made no further pretence of disapproval and the reconciliation was perfectly genuine as far as it went i am going to see you to the gate mark trixie announced as he rose to go it was not a long or perilous journey but she had an object in accompanying him down the little flagged path i've got something to tell you she said as they stood by the iron gate in the hot august night i wish i knew how to begin mark how would you like a a new brother because i'm going to give you one thanks very much trixie said mark but i think i can get along without another of them ah uh, but jack would be a nice one said trixie mark remembered then that he had noticed a decided improvement in her dress and appearance and who is this jack whom you're so disinterestedly going to make me a present of he asked jack is one of the masters at the art school said trixie he's awfully handsome not in your style but fair with a longer moustache and he's too clever almost to live he had one picture in the grosvenor this year in a little room down by the bottom somewhere but he hasn't sold it and when i first went to the school all the girls declared he came round to me twice as much as he did to them and they made themselves perfectly horrid about it so i had to ask him not to come so often and he didn't for a time then one day he asked me if i would rather he never came to me at all and and i couldn't say yes and so somehow we got engaged ma's furious about it and so is martha but then ma has never seen jack and martha has i see put in mark jack knows a lot about literature he admires illusion immensely mark added trixie thinking in her innocence that this would enlist his sympathy at once he wants to know you dreadfully well trixie said mark paternally you must bring him to see me we mustn't have you doing anything imprudent you know let me see what i think of him i hope he's a good fellow oh he is said trixie if you could only see some of his sketches a day or two later mark had an opportunity of meeting his intending brother-in-law of whom he found no particular reason to disapprove though he secretly thought him a slightly commonplace young man and too inclined to be familiar with himself and shortly after he started for the black forest whither caffin had prevailed upon him to be his companion he thought it would be amusing and serve to keep his vengeance alive to have his intended victim always at hand but the result did not quite come up to his hopes mark had so lulled his fears to rest that the most artfully planned introduction of holroyd's name failed to disturb him 
he thought chiefly during their wanderings of mabel and her smile and words at parting and in this occupation he was so pleasantly absorbed that it was impossible to rouse him by any means short of the rudest awakening and by and by a curious change took place in caffyn's feelings towards him in spite of himself the virulence of his hatred began to abate time and change of scene were proving more powerful than he had anticipated away from mabel his hatred even of her flagged more and more with every day and he was disarmed as against mark by the evident pleasure the latter took in his society for the most objectionable persons become more bearable when we discover that they have a high opinion of us it is such a redeeming touch in their nature and besides with all the reason caffyn had for cherishing a grudge against mark somehow as they became more intimate he slid gradually into a half contemptuous and half affectionate tolerance he began to think that he would find satisfaction in standing by and letting events work themselves out he would let this poor fellow enjoy fool's paradise as long as might be no doubt the luxury of secretively enjoying the situation had a great deal to do with this generosity of his but the fact remains that for some reason he was passing from an enemy to a neutral and might on occasion even become an ally if nothing occurred to fan his hatred to flame in the meanwhile towards the end of their tour they arrived at triburg late one saturday evening and on the sunday caffyn having risen late and finding that mark had breakfasted and gone out alone was climbing the path by the waterfall when on one of the bridges which span the cascade he saw a girl's figure leaning listlessly over the rough rail it was gilda featherstone and he thought he could detect an additional tinge in her cheeks and a light in her eyes as he came towards her her father and mother were in one of the shelters above and mrs featherstone's greeting when she recognized him was the reverse of cordial this young man might not have followed them there but it looked extremely like it and if she could not order him out of the black forest as if she had taken it for the summer she would at least give him no encouragement to stay unfortunately her husband behaved with an irritating effusiveness he liked caffyn and besides had not seen an englishman to talk to familiarly for some days they were going home next day he had better come with them well if he could not do that mrs featherstone having interposed icily mr caffyn has just told you robert that he is with a friend he must come to them the moment he returned to england and they would give him some shooting mrs featherstone had to hear this invitation and caffyn's instant acceptance of it with what philosophy she might it was useless to remonstrate with her husband on his blindness he had democratic views which might even bear a practical test and she could only trust to chance and her mother wit to prevent any calamity but she was unusually silent as they walked down the winding path back to the hotel where they were all staying there was a midday table d'hote where the proprietor a most imposing and almost pontifical personage officiated as at a religious ceremonial solemnly ladling out the soup to devout waiters as if he were blessing each portion after which he stood by and contented himself with lending his countenance at a rather high rate of interest to the meal caffyn's chair was placed next to gilda's and they kept up a continuous flow of conversation mark saw them both looking at him at one time and wondered at the sudden change in caffyn's face which unless his fancy misled him had a frown on it that was almost threatening but he was not allowed much time to speculate on the causes for mrs featherstone perhaps to emphasize her disapproval of his companion distinguished mark by engrossing his entire attention that afternoon mark was sitting outside the hotel taking his coffee at one of the little round iron tables by the inevitable trio of scrubby orange trees in green tubs when caffyn whom he had not seen since leaving the table came up and sat down beside him without a word have you come out for some coffee asked mark no said caffyn shortly i came out to have a few words with you the featherstones had all gone off to attend the english afternoon service there was no one very near them though in the one broad street there was a certain gentle animation of townspeople promenading up and down in sunday array 
spectacled young officers with slender waists and neat uniforms swaggering about a portly and gorgeous crier in a green uniform ringing his bell over a departed purse little old walnut-faced women sitting patiently by their fruit stalls and a band of local firemen in very baggy tunics the smallest men of whom had crept inside the biggest silver helmets preparing to execute a selection of airs you look uncommonly serious about something old fellow said mark laughing lightly what is it this said caffyn with a smouldering fire in his voice and eyes i've just been told that you you are engaged to mabel langton is it true mark was not displeased this coupling of mabel's name with his even though a mere rumour sent a delicious thrill through him it seemed to bring his sweetest hopes nearer realization the gay little street vanished for an instant and he was holding mabel's hand in the violet-scented drawing-room but he came to himself almost directly with a start who told you that he said flushing slightly never mind who told me is it true uh, i warn you not to trifle with me what on earth is the matter with you said mark no it's not true as far as i know at present there is not the remotest possibility of such a thing coming to pass but you would make it possible if you could eh asked caffyn i don't want to hurt your feelings caffyn said mark but really you're going a little too far and even if i had been engaged to miss langton which is very far from the case i don't exactly see what right you have after under the circumstances you know to go in for the fire-eating business you mean i'm out of the running whoever wins said caffyn i dare say you're right i'm not aware that i ever entered for the prize but never mind that she has taken a dislike to me but i may be allowed to feel an interest in her still i suppose i should like to see her happy and if you could tell me that you were the man why then well said mark as the other paused with a curious smile why then i should feel at ease about her don't you know he said gently i only wish i could ease your mind for you in that way said mark but it's too soon for that yet you do mean to ask her then said caffyn with his eyes on the little brown and yellow imperial postwagen which had just rattled up to the hotel and the driver of which in his very unbecoming glazed billycock hat with the feather brush plume was then cumbrously descending from his box mark had not meant to confide in caffyn at all he had only known him a short time and although their intimacy had grown so rapidly with a little more reflection he might have shrunk from talking of mabel to one whom rightly or wrongly she held in abhorrence but then caffyn was so sympathetic so subdued the temptation to talk of his love to somebody was so strong that he did not try to resist it yes i do he said and his dark eyes were soft and dreamy as he spoke some day if i dare and if she says what i hope she will say i shall come to you old fellow for congratulations he looked round but caffyn had started up abruptly and he was alone very odd of him thought mark until he saw him meeting the featherstones on their way back from the service some minutes later as gilda and caffyn were in a corner of the exhibition of carved work at the lower end of the town she took advantage of the blaring of two big orchestral black forest organs each performing a different overture and of the innumerable cuckoo cries from the serried rows of clocks on the walls to go back to their conversation at the table d'hote have you asked him yet mabel is not engaged to him after all her face fell as she gathered this it is all a mistake then of course it was a great relief to you to hear that was it was caffyn's rejoinder why why because oh of course you would be relieved to hear it and gilda made a little attempt to laugh shall i tell you something he said gravely do you know that i've just begun to think nothing would give me greater satisfaction now than to hear that the rumour you told me of was an accomplished fact and that mabel was engaged to mr ashburn do you really mean it cried gilda and her face cleared again i really mean it said caffyn smiling and it is just possible that he really did 
Gilda, you're not helping me in the least, said Mrs. Featherstone, coming up at this juncture. And there's your father threatening to get that big clock with a horrid cuckoo in it for the hall at the Grange. Come and tell him, if he must have one, to buy one of the long plain ones. And Gilda went obediently, for she could feel an interest in clocks and carvings now. End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five mabel's answer the wet autumn had merged into a premature season of fog and slush while a violent gale had stripped off the leaves long before their time winter was at hand and already one or two of the hardiest christmas annuals fresh from editorial forcing-houses had blossomed on the bookstalls, and a few masks and Roman candles, misled by appearances, had stolen into humble shop fronts long before November had begun. All the workers, except the junior clerks in offices, who were now receiving permission to enjoy their annual fortnight, were returning, and even idlers who had no country house hospitality to give or receive were glad to escape some of their burden amongst the mild distractions of a winter in town. Mrs. Langton, who detested the country, had persuaded her husband to let their place Glenthorne for the last two winters, and she and her daughter had already returned to Kensington Park Gardens after a round of visits, leaving Mr. Langton to enjoy a little more shooting before the courts reopened. Cathy was now away at the Featherstone's country seat, somewhere in the Midlands, and Mark, who remained in town after their return from Germany, had taken the earliest opportunity of calling on the Langtons, when Mabel seemed more frankly glad to see him than he had dared to hope, and in one short half-hour the understanding between them had advanced several months. She showed the greatest interest in his wanderings, and he described the various petty adventures in his most effective manner, until even Mrs. Langton was roused to a little indulgent laughter. When Dolly came in later, Mark was embraced enthusiastically. "'I was so afraid you wouldn't be back in time for my party,' she said. "'You will come, now, won't you? It's tomorrow week. My birthday, you know.' And, of course, Mark was delighted to promise to come, as Mabel seconded the invitation. "'We're quite at a loss to know how to amuse the children,' she said a little later. "'Perhaps you can help us to an idea.' "'We could have the performing pygmies,' said Mrs. Langton. "'But the boys might tread on them, and that would be so expensive, you know.' "'Don't have any performing things, mother,' pleaded Dolly. "'Have only dancing.' "'Most of the boys hate dancing,' said Mabel. "'Some of them don't a bit,' urged Dolly. "'And those who do can stay away. I don't want them. "'But don't have entertainments. "'They always leave a horrid mess that take hours to clear away after them.' "'It's all very well for you, Dolly,' said Mabel, laughing. "'But I shall have to keep the boys in order. "'And last time they played at robbers, "'tramping about all over the house. "'And when everyone had gone, "'there was one of them left behind upstairs, Mr. Ashbourne, "'howling to be let out of the cupboard.' "'Bobby Fraser, that was,' said Dolly. "'Stupid little duffer. "'We won't have him this time. "'And, Mother, darling, I want to dance all the time.' and it's my own party dancing is enough it is really she pleaded in a pretty frenzy of impatience and dolly got her own way as usual mabel was a little surprised at her own pleasure in seeing mark again she had looked forward to meeting him but without being prepared for this wild joy that sprang up in her heart as he pressed her hand and with that unmistakable delight in his eyes at being in her presence do i care for him as much as that she asked herself and the question answered itself as such questions do mark was his own master now for he had given up his appointment at st peter's although mr shelford strongly advised him to go in for some regular profession besides literature there'll come a day he told him when you've played out all your tunes and your barrel is worn smooth and no one will throw you any more coppers then you'll want a regular employment to fall back on. Why don't you get called? 
because i don't want to be tied down said mark i want to go about and study character i want to enjoy my life while i can so did the grasshopper said mr shelford you don't believe in me i know said mark you think i shall never do anything like illusion again well i believe in myself i think my tunes will last out my life at all events i really work uncommonly hard i have two novels ready for the press at this moment which is pretty well for a mere grasshopper but wearing for a mere barrel organ said the old gentleman be careful don't write too much the public never forgive a disappointment whatever you do give them of your best and shortly after this conversation mark left his novel sweet bells jangled with chilton and fladgate mentioning terms which even to himself seemed slightly exorbitant he had a note from the firm in the course of a day or two appointing an interview and on going up to the publishing office found both of the partners waiting to receive him mr chilton was a spare angular man who confined himself chiefly to the purely financial department we have decided to accept your terms subject to a few modifications which we can discuss presently he said you think the book is likely to be a success asked mark unable to control his anxiety any work by the author of illusion is sure to command attention said mr chilton but you like the subject pursued mark mr chilton coughed i can express no opinion he said i don't profess to be a judge of these matters fladgate has read the book he will tell you what he thinks about it but mr fladgate remained silent and mark much as he longed to oppress him was too proud to do so however as the firm demanded a rather considerable reduction of the original terms mr fladgate in explanation admitted at length that he did not consider sweet bells jangled altogether up to the standard of mark's first work and intimated that it would not be advisable to risk bringing it out before the spring season i see said mark nettled you are not particularly hopeful about it oh said mr fladgate with a wave of his hand i wouldn't say that chance has a good deal to do with these affairs a good deal to do i confess i miss some of the qualities that charmed me in your illusion it reads to me if i may say so like an earlier effort a much earlier effort but it may hit the popular taste for all that it is certainly in quite a different vein mark came away rather depressed but he soon persuaded himself that a publisher was a not infallible judge of literary merit and then the firm had every object in depreciating the work whilst negotiations were proceeding for all that he felt uncomfortable now and then and he had not wholly got rid of his depression by the time of dolly's birthday party on his arrival he found that dolly's wish had been gratified dancing was the main attraction and in the principal room were the usual iron-fisted pianist and red-faced cornet player who should be such profound moralists with all their nightly experiences and dainty little girls were whirling round with the fortunate boys who had elder sisters at home to bully them into acquiring the mysteries of the valse while the less favoured stood in doorways jibing with the scornfulness of envy the least observing might trace the course of several naive preferences and innocent flirtations during the earlier part of the evening big bright-faced boys in devoted attendance on shy and unconscious small maidens many years their juniors and en revanche determined little ladies triumphantly towing about smaller boys who seemed sometimes elated but mostly resigned while one youthful misogynist openly rebelled and fled to mabel for protection declaring ungallantly that he would rather be at home in bed than bothered like that any longer dolly was enjoying herself amazingly dancing chiefly however with her dearest girl-friend for the time being since none of the boys danced well enough to please either of them and besides boys rather bored dolly to whom dancing as yet was merely a particularly delightful form of exercise and who had no precocious tendencies to coquetry she deigned to dance once with mark after which he did his duty by trotting out a succession of calm and self-possessed little girls who were as unchildlike as if they had been out for a season or two 
then he thought he might reward himself by going to look for mabel whom he found in one of the lower rooms endeavouring to amuse the smaller and non-dancing members of the company she was standing under the centre lamp flushed and laughing with two or three children clinging to her dress and met his amused and admiring eyes with a little gesture of comic despair we've played all the games that were ever invented she said and now some of them are getting rough and the rest cross and there's half an hour before supper and i don't in the least know what to do with them till then shall i see what i can do with them said mark rather rashly oh if you would it would be so kind of you i'm afraid you don't know what you're exposing yourself to mark not being devoted to children felt more than a little dubious himself but he wanted to be associated with her in something and volunteered manfully look here he began as they all stood about staring at him miss langton's a little tired ah uh, i am going to play with you a little now what shall we have eh blind man's buff but they had had that and presently one small boy bolder than the rest said play at being jumbo a proposal which seemed generally popular then may i leave you here said mabel i must go and speak to mother about something don't let them be too tiresome this was by no means what mark had bargained for but he found himself deserted and reduced to play at being jumbo with the best possible grace it was a simple but severe game consisting in the performer of the principal role who was mark himself on this occasion going down on his hands and knees and staggering about the carpet while everyone else who could find room climbed on his back and thumped him on the head at last in self-defence he was obliged to get rid of them by intimating that he had gone mad when he had to justify his words by careering around the room trumpeting fiercely while the children scuttled away before him in an ecstasy of sham terror at first mark was profoundly miserable and even glad that mabel had not remained to witness his humiliation but by and by he began to enter into the spirit of the thing and had entirely forgotten his dignity by the time mabel reappeared Caffin, who had now returned from the Featherstones and had received an invitation from Mrs. Langton in Mabel's absence, we've known him from a boy, my dear, the former had said in justification, and he can recite some things to keep the children quiet, you know, stood in the doorway behind her and looked on with a smile of pity. But she saw nothing ridiculous in Mark just then, and, as he was probably aware, he could stand such tests better than most men she only thought that his willingness to sacrifice himself for others was a pleasant trait in his character don't get up ashburn it's delightful to see you making yourself so hot my dear fellow said caffyn one doesn't get the chance of seeing a successful author ramping about on all fours every day i can't get up said mark and in fact a small but unpleasantly sturdy boy had pounced on him as he paused for breath and with the sense that he was doing something courageous was in course of taming the elephant with a hearth-brush what a shame cried mabel tommy you horrid boy you're hurting mr ashburn and the hearth-brush was certainly coming down with considerable vigour on the small of the amateur elephant's back i think myself gasped mark that i could bear being shipped off to america now yes indeed she said compassionately you mustn't be tormented any more tommy let the poor elephant alone you've tamed him very nicely jumbo had his hind legs tied urged tommy who had a taste for realism i don't think that will be necessary objected mark i'm beautifully tamed now master tommy observe the mildness of my eye the game's over now said mabel with decision there mr ashburn your elephant life is over tommy come and button my glove for me like a dear fellow how dreadfully hot you are and now mr caffey is going to recite something come upstairs all of you and listen for mrs langton had begged him to do something to amuse the children i don't want them to dance too much she had said if you could manage to cool them down before supper i'll cool them down said caffey to himself with one of his peculiar impulses to safe and secret malevolence 
if you will get them all together dear mrs langton he replied i'll see what i can do and accordingly he entertained them with a harrowing little poem about a poor child dying of starvation in a garret and dreaming of wealthier and happier children enjoying themselves at parties which made all the children uncomfortable and some of the less stolid ones cry and then he told them a ghost story crammed with ingenious horrors which followed most of them home to bed mabel listened in burning indignation she would have liked to stop him but grown-up persons were beginning to filter in and she was afraid of making anything like a scene by interfering however when he came up blandly after the performance she let him see her opinion of it oh they like to have their flesh creep he said with a shrug it's one of the luxuries of youth it isn't a wholesome one she said but i know you have your own theories of the proper way to, to amuse a child she felt a revival of her disgust for the sly treachery he had revealed once before he gave her a cold glance and the lines round his mouth tightened for an instant you haven't forgiven me then he said i can't forget she answered in a low voice we both have good memories it seems he retorted with a short laugh as he held up a curtain for her to pass and turned away it was after supper and most of the children had been weeded out to be replaced by children of a larger growth mark came up to mabel as she stood by the doorway while the musicians were playing the first few bars of a waltz and each couple was waiting for some other to begin before them you promise me a dance he said in reward for my agility as an elephant aren't your duties over now i think everybody knows everybody now and no one is sitting out said mabel but really i would rather not dance just yet i'm a little tired for the fräulein was still away with her family in germany and most of the work had fallen upon mabel who was feeling some need of a rest mark did not try to persuade her you must be he agreed will you do you mind sitting this dance out with me she made no objection and they were presently sitting together under the soft light of the ribbed chinese lanterns in a fernery at the back of the rooms when we go back said mabel i want to introduce you to a miss torrington a great admirer of your book but you don't care for such things do you i wish with all my soul i might never hear of the book again said mark gloomily i i beg your pardon it sounds ungrateful and yet if you knew if you only knew he was in one of his despondent moods just then when his skeleton came out of the cupboard and gibbered at him what right had he with this fraud on his soul to be admitted even to the ordinary friendship of a sweet and noble girl what would she say to him if she knew and for a moment he felt a mad impulse to tell her i wish you would tell me she said gently as if answering the impulse but the suggestion put into words sobered him she would despise him she must he could not bear to see his shame reflected in her eyes so he told her half-truths only it is only that i am so tired of being tied to a book he said passionately tied i am a book every one i meet sees in me not a man to be judged and liked for himself but something to criticise and flatter and compare with the nature he revealed in print half-truth as this was it was more sincere than such confidences are apt to be your book is you or a part of you said mabel it seems so absurd that you should be jealous of it i am he said not so much with others but when i am with you it tortures me when you show me any kindness i think she would not say that she would not do this if i were not the author of illusion she honours the book not you only the book how unjust said mabel she could not think it a perverted form of diseased vanity he plainly undervalued his work himself and its popularity was a real vexation to him she could only be sorry for him but i see proof of it in others every now and then continued mark people who do not connect me at first with cyril ernstone only the other day some of them went so far as to apologize for having snubbed me before they knew who i was 
i don't complain of that of course i'm not such an idiot but it does make me doubtful of the other extreme and i cannot bear the doubt in your case his eyes were raised pleadingly to hers he seemed longing and yet dreading to speak more plainly mabel's heart beat quicker there was a subtle delicious flattery in such self-abasement before her of a man she admired so much would he say more then or would he wait as far as she knew her own mind she hoped he would wait a little longer she said nothing being perhaps afraid of saying too much yet i know it will be so said mark the book will be forgotten with the next literary sensation and i shall drop under with it you will see me about less often till one day you pass me in the street and wonder who i am and if you ever met me at all i don't think i ever gave you the right to say that she said wounded at his tone and you ought to know that i should not do anything of the sort will you tell me this he said and his voice trembled with anxiety if if i had not written this book which was happy enough to give you some pleasure if i had met you simply as mark ashburn a man who had never written a line in his life would you have been the same to me would you have felt even such interest in me as i like to think sometimes you do feel try to give me an answer you don't know how much it will mean to me mabel took refuge in the impersonal of course she said one often likes a person one never saw very much for something he has done but i think if you ever do meet him and then don't like him for himself you dislike him all the more for disappointing you it's a kind of reaction i suppose tell me this too mark entreated is is that my case if it had been she said softly do you think i should have said that something in her tone gave mark courage to dare everything then you do care for me a little he cried mabel i can speak now i loved you ever since i first saw you in that old country church i never meant to tell you so soon but i can't help it i want you i can't live without you will you come to me mabel she put both hands trustfully in his as she said yes mark and without any more words just then on either side their troth was plighted he was still holding the hands she had resigned to him hardly daring as yet to believe in this realization of his dearest hopes when someone stepped quickly in through the light curtains it was caffin and he put up his eyeglass to conceal a slight start as he saw who were there sent to look for somebody's fan told it was left on the folding chair ah sorry to trouble you ashburn that's it behind you i won't say i found you sitting on it and he went out with his prize i think after that said mabel with a little laugh though she was annoyed too you had better take me back again and mark obeyed feeling that the unromantic interruption had effectually broken the spell fortunately it had happened after and not before his fate had been decided the evening was over and he was waiting to recover his hat and overcoat when he was joined by caffin umbrella missing began the latter mine is like the departed christians on the tombstones you know not lost but gone before are you going my way come on then when they were outside in the moonlight he took mark's arm and said you've got something to tell me haven't you i told you i should come to you for congratulations when we were at triberg said mark but i never hoped to be able to come so soon she has said yes old fellow i can't trust myself to talk about it just yet but i can't help telling you that caffin clapped him on the back with a shout of rather wild laughter what a fortunate beggar you are he said fame fortune and now a charming girl to crown it all you'll be rousing the envy of the gods soon you know unless you're careful End of chapter twenty five